This week they include John Bly, who I know is already extremely enthusiastic about some of the furniture he's seen being brought in. Also with us is Bunny Campione. She's on the lookout for any interesting toys and dolls. Over on Pottery and Porcelain, we have David Batty, who's joined this week by Terence Lockett. And pictures are the province of David Collins with fellow expert Philip Hook. Simon Bull will, of course, be covering clocks, watches and scientific instruments. So let's now join our experts with the people of Farnham. Father um, picked it up at a, a local sort of second-hand um, junk shop at Hailing Island, where we were living 40 years ago. Oh, right. And he paid, I think, about £10 for it, gave Did it to it? me. I used to keep one of my baby teeth in it. Oh, how I lovely. To take I'm glad you've taken it. There's something ironic about keeping teeth in a cabinet yes. made of ivory, yes. which, of course, is actually a tooth anyway. I thought I mean, that was going, appropriate. It is a very appropriate. Yes. Yeah, so I'm glad you've uh, decanted them now. That's nice. Um, this is Japanese, and it dates from around the end of the last century. It's yes. about 1890 to 1900. Yes. And they made large numbers of these miniature cabinets, uh, really for export. They weren't for domestic uh, Japanese consumption. The nice thing about this one is the, is the quality of it. Um, it's extremely well decorated uh, with lacquer in different colors. Um, and then tiny touches laid in uh, with uh, iridescent uh, shell. And the subject matter on here um, is of a Japanese hero. He's called Agara no Haida. And he kills this enormous serpent, which oh. was large enough to swallow a man. Good grief. And that's yes. what he's doing on here. Yes. And then, of course, we've got the usual subject of, of birds flying around. We've got a nice scene on the top of a cockerel and a hen. And on the side here, um, we've got this beautiful, uh, I suppose it's supposed to be a pheasant, isn't it? A, a Chinese pheasant. And then on the back, cranes. Now, of course, the Manchurian or red-headed crane um, is a symbol of, of long life in the East. Yes. Um, as indeed is the pine tree, so there may be some sort of idea there. And here we've got Mount Fuji, Fujiyama, oh, yes. uh, the, the Japanese mountain. Opening up a whole lot of different drawers here for different purposes and a little tiny shelf. The corners I see are inlaid with, um, uh, abound with copper. Uh, this would fetch somewhere in the region of um, two to three thousand pounds. Oh, that's a bit worrying. It was a good ten quid's worth, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. Your clock uh, belongs to a small group that are still somewhat contentious in their history. Yes. Exteriorly, we have a relatively straightforward long case clock. Uh, it potentially a London case, but it could even be provincial. The door is uh, strain, plain rectangular. We have a, a a plain figuring, no, none of the flamboyant flame pattern. Coming down to the base, you will actually notice here, in fact, at the bottom, they've replaced the kick board here. This right. plinth. In fact, they've even rather built it up. It may have been that somebody wanted it higher, or probably the bottom edge of this plinth rotted, mm -hmm. and they've supported it with this, and you can quite clearly see it's in pine. Right. Yes. So there's nothing really special about the case, except uh, going right up again to the top, up here, we've got three holes that somebody has later broken through to let the sound out. Right. This fret was originally backed by probably a silk which over the years with mm. polish and wax has just gone so dark. Uh, yes. that there, were, there were piercing holes certainly at the top here for frets for the sound to come out but I think these are rather later they're so badly yes. placed. I think that damage was done in our own house actually about 10 years ago. Really? Yeah I'm sure it was in fact. Yeah. Young fingers poking yes. holes in. Yes it was actually. Yes. <laughs> One young daughter. Yeah. But the interesting point about the clock is the dial. Now this dial is in enamel mm -hmm. and there are clocks with enamel dials but to have the whole square in enamel and to have it painted with this manganese decorated uh, Rococo design is very rare. There are probably no more than about 20 clocks known with this sort of dial. The, the controversy is where they were painted. And I don't claim to be an expert on English enamels of the late 18th century. But Staffordshire is one possibility, that's Bilston factory. Yes. And the other possibility is Battersea. And some people go towards Battersea because the painting is very fine. Now, if we can take the hood off, because there's one other interesting feature. It's basically a conventional clock, but there is one other feature that you notice with all these clocks. Take the moved out. Okay. In order to fit these dials, mm. you can see 
well here. This is a thin copper plate. Yes. Uh, with a counter enamel because it's so thin that if you didn't enamel both sides, mm. it would basically it wouldn't hold. It would buckle. Right. And they always have a false plate or a plate in between, which is this plate here, brass, heavy brass plate, yes. to support the enamel dial onto the movement. Right. And that's classic of all the three or four examples mm. I've seen, and I'm mm. sure of the others. Mm. Were you saying you've only seen twenty in that kind of face? There, I only know of 20, yes, right. I certainly haven't seen 20. Yes, no. I've seen three or four no. clocks myself with them, and also a couple of bracket clocks. Right. And they're all similar, they're all using the same decoration on the dial mm -hmm. and everything else. No. Uh, it's a, strangely, the value is not, I know they're extremely rare, but the value is not uh, particularly high. high. Mm -hmm. now, they're worth about 3,000, 3,500 pounds, something like that. It, it is. It's more than we thought. Oh, well, We're delighted. Yes. <laughs> it's a Wealdon pipe. A Wealdon pipe. Yes. It's not just any old clay pipe. No. This is what I suppose we would call a tortoise shell, a glazed on a creamware body. Uh, yes. Um, that's a Wealdon is a generic name for these tortoise shell wares. Yes. It's been in our family for many years. Ah yes. Uh, this I've, particular pipe's been in your family. This particular pipe. Any any family connection? Yes. Uh, well, the same name. You mean you are Mr. Wielding? I'm one, <laughs> one of the Mr. Wieldens. You're yes. one of the. Yes. Well, perhaps we should tell, say that uh, Thomas Wielden was a very was, famous potter in yes. Stoke-on-Trent. Fenton, Vivian, he potted out. That is so. In the 1750s and 1760s, right through until his death. And in fact, was a partner or had as a partner the great Josiah Wedgwood. Yes. Yeah. He, uh, in fact, Josiah Webb Wedgwood was an apprentice of Thomas yes. Wielden. Yeah. Well, uh, it's a very, very unusual and lovely little object with the, the dog mask and everything to it. Um, I, is it going to go on in the family? Are you going oh, to pass yes. It yeah? yes. Yeah, very much yeah, so. Yeah. Because yes. it's, it is extremely rare. I don't think I've ever seen one quite like it before because what you might call common or garden objects like this, they would be literally two a penny, if not more to a penny, yes. uh, and would easily get broken. 1750 perhaps it was made, yes. 1760, something like that. If we were to see it in a major antique fair, it would be valued at, well, I don't know, it's terribly difficult because they don't come up for sale. Um, well over a thousand pounds. This Dutch sugar box isn't the, isn't the normal object that I see on the road show. How, how did, I mean, it is a marvellous um, quality piece. I've just been picking it up and the actual weight it's of silver heavy. is, is yes, tremendous. Is. And um, something that makes this extra weight on this piece is the extraordinary fact that the most the majority of it is cast you know when you see yes, something like this whether it's a, mm. a teapot or a tea caddy or mm. something that's a hollow ware piece um, more often than not it's actually sheet silver that's beaten and raised yes. up mm. but here this is cast in sections and then seamed at, yes, at the I've various angles that. mm. and that's why it's such tremendous weight I see. Um, and the decoration, I think, is, is, is lovely. It's um, beautifully defined um, Rococo scrolls and shell work. The marks are a little bit indistinct. We can't tell who the, who the maker is. Um, but it is, it is an Amsterdam one. And it appears to me to date from the early six, 1760s, about mm -hmm. 1764, I think that's the date left for that year. Um, the <clears throat> Dutch silver of, of the mid 18th century is well sought after and you know, can be valuable. Mm. The wonderful quality, the heavy weight, the fine decoration, mm. um, I think is going to make it the sort of thing that we would probably estimate at auction around four thousand mm. pounds, um, mm. and it could well, you know, it could well do, do do rather more. Those eyes go up and down, saying, "I've got a Farley's yes. rust." Yes. This mm. one's crying his eyes out, saying, "He hasn't got one." I want one too. <laughs> it's actually very amusing, and I should yes. think it might have been in a shop. They, yes, they were in our shop. Oh, they were in your shop? In our own shop, yes. Well, I would say, you know, in a doll market, they're probably worth a couple of hundred pounds just because they're so interesting. You know, this really is a most splendid example of a Neapolitan gouache um, ship's portrait by an artist called Nicola 
Funi, showing uh, Gwen made of Milford in the Bay of Naples. This type of art today is being bought by Italian buyers for taking back to Naples and its environs. Yet in the first place, it was obviously commissioned by the master of the boat to bring back to here. Uh, its value today would be somewhere in the region of around, say, two to two and a half thousand pounds at auction. It, rep it, it represents what? It's the white slave trade. That's right, yes. Look. Yes, yes. Isn't it marvellous? <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Very naughty. <laughs> It's Austrian coal painted. Is it? Yeah. That it, surprises but they're very collectible. Yes. Isn't it wonderful? Yes. <laughs> it's hilarious. These were made in Portugal at the end of the last century. And I think they're great fun. I think they're underrated. I mean, the idea goes back to France in the 16th century. Um, but here we've got one um, made simply for decoration. I used to, I, I've got, I had one of these. I loved it. So it stood on the floor by the cellar steps. And then my wife kicked it down the steps one day, and I claim she did it on purpose. I don't know whether she did. Standard mark on the back. Um, that's going to be worth in the region of 100 to 150. It's very nice. This pair of pistols, which are normally known as howdah pistols by collectors, because when they were out hunting tigers on the back of elephants, they often had a large calibre pair of pistols in case the tiger came up to the back of the elephant and tried to swarm over the top and attack the men in the howdah. That aside, they were very popular with <laughs> army officers because they gave four guaranteed shots with the pair and they could easily be stuck into the coattail pocket. And these particular ones are of 16 bore, which is the military pistol service cartridge of the time. So this would be the sort of thing that um, a young subaltern going out to India, who was fairly well healed, would go into Rodders of Piccadilly, who also had uh, an office in Calcutta, and hence the Indian connection. And if he were reasonably well off, he would be able to afford a pair of these pistols, because obviously in those days, officers armed themselves and found all their own kit. And they are a good quality pair of pistols, made in London, and we can tell that their quality is good, because if we look there, they have a patent breech with a little screw there that you can remove to give it a, a very thorough cleaning there to make sure that it doesn't misfire. And the barrels are of best quality Damascus twist, which is wire wrapped around a former and then hammered at white heat. So you get a very strong barrel, almost um, with an elastic quality that um, will enable it to withstand the charge and yet not be so brittle that it would burst. Right, they come in their original box and somebody who was out on campaign or traveling would have had everything he needed to maintain his pistols, produce the ammunition, keep them loaded. Are, are they a, f a family? As a small child, I remember uh, when not feeling very well in in bed or something, father used to get them out and um, show them to me just to perk me up a bit. Yes, and you know? they, they certainly would have perked yeah. me up if I'd have seen them as a yeah, small right. boy. You should certainly insure them for £2,000 at least. <laughs> and you can see that the, the, the timber is cut that way to give those long streaks, so that's down along the grain. See, then yeah. it's laid on herringbone fashion, opened up and laid juxtaposition to give that sort of chevron type. And then this is cut as you cut a piece of French bread straight across to show the medullary rays of the timber. Nice. Laid on, mm. often done in laburnum as well, but the, the nice thing yes. about this is that it is used all the way through. Yes. And all the mouldings laid on in little sections, yes. as you would expect at the beginning of the 18th century. Nice. So really, yeah. it's a remarkable little cabinet, a perfect piece in miniature, yes. about 1700, 1695, 1700, mm -hmm. and all the original candles, when we open it up here, mm. they are absolutely delightful. Look at that. This is a, a collector's delight, but also refining that to a collector of yew wood. I mean, there are collectors mm -hmm. of furniture made of yew, and this is as fine an example as you'll ever see. Yeah. I do love these. I think that is, this is quite magic to see mercurially gilded handles. They've never been washed off, never been rubbed yeah. of their gilt. Absolutely delightful. Nice dovetails, absolutely yes. one we'd expect to see. But this reddle stuff is all original. It was a sort of preservative they put on oh, I uh, see. at the time. Yes. There's one thing that does intrigue me. There's a gap there. Something yes. missing. Oh. oh it, it's a secret drawer, isn't it? Is there a That's secret drawer? 
Yes, you can take that out and pull that out. Ah, uh, yes. And that's a secret door. Oh, how lovely. He wants a little secret. <laughs> very, very nice. Very nice. Well, now what is the story behind this? How long have you had it? About 30 or 40 years, I suppose. And is it a family one? It at, uh, no, I bought it at the antique dealer's fair, Grosvenor House. <laughs> Wonderful. I must ask you how much you paid for it. Forty pounds. Forty pounds. <laughs> Goodness gracious me. Goodness gracious me. I suppose it was a lot of money then. It was a lot of money. For a luxury I piece. <laughs> I think it would cost you about 4,000 today if you were to buy it, if you could find one as nice as this. <laughs> and it's As still delightful. Yeah, no, my great art gave it to me about 30 years ago. Question, did you like it? Yes. Good. Yeah, I like it too. Uh, let's, let's start at the top and let me first of all explain that, of course, it, the silver is encasing glass, mm -hmm. iridescent glass. Um, and it's one of those things that you, I can see from 100 yards um, and know immediately that we're looking at a piece of Lurtz glass. I had a piece in South Wales last year um, which was of a more elaborate form. But for my money, the silver overlay wares are... Um, they've got that little bit of extra. I have to admit that it was one of life's mysteries to me, how on earth they managed to blow the glass mm. into the front. Did you, have you ever given that a bit yeah. of thought? Good, I'm glad it's not just me. <laughs> um, well, the secret is that, that they don't. Oh. Um, that what happens is you've got this lovely iridescent glass, it's known as papillon glass or butterfly, butterfly glass, because if we, we just turn it, you can see how it catches, it's rather like a butterfly's wing, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. Wonderful iridescence. Well, they do it by a process of electrolysis. And um, basically what they do is they, they, they build up um, a layer of silver um, in, any, in the desired area. Yeah. Um, and then they just gently, if there's any residue, they just carve it away. And then there's a certain amount of hand finishing very similar in style to Tiffany glass, um, but Lurtz uh, in Austria, working around about, um, it's probably that's about 1900. It's always, been, it's always been thought of as being the sort of poor cousin to Tiffany, which is not fair, um, because it stands like, they were making glass before Tiffany at this time. So um, I suppose value comes into it at some stage, doesn't it? Have you ever given any thought? No? No, no. I just Well, let's it. get to the point and tell you it's worth between eight to 1,200 pounds. So be careful when you're polishing it, won't you? I will now, yeah. Right, good. <laughs> well, now we leave our tables for a moment for the new competition, which we're running in conjunction with Radio Times. You may indeed remember the competition last year. It was a, a great success. So here we go again. And it really is, you know, well worthwhile having a go because every week there'll be a chance of winning a voucher to the value of £2,500, which you can then spend on antiques of your choice. And so to the first competition object, and here it is, this marvellous rug which was woven nearly a hundred years ago, and it uses uh, in its design a fairly well-known legend of the 11th century. And the legend is of a famous huntsman, which we see here uh, astride his horse, and he's uh, apparently boasted to his lover that he's such a good shot, he can actually pin the hind leg of a gazelle against its ear with his arrow, and that is precisely what is done. The legend, however, goes on to say that the lover was not in the least bit impressed, and so she is cast aside and trampled on. Now, the detail in this uh, work really is just amazing, down to the fish here swimming in the river below, the bird's nest here in this tree, and just look at this, even the nails here in the horse's hoof. The rug is woven from the finest quality wool, which is what gives it this marvellous velvety texture, and it comes from an area very well known for the making of fine uh, quality rugs. And they used figurative subjects such as this and also more unusual floral designs. And so to the question, in which country was this rug made? Now, you might find it helpful to look at a copy of the new Radio Times, which, as well as giving you more details of the competition, also goes so far as to suggest a few possible answers. And then your entry needs to be in the post and addressed to the Radio Times, not the Antiques Roadshow, postmarked before next Saturday. And if you do all that, you'll stand a chance of winning, as I say, this £2,500 antiques voucher. Well, the answer to this week's question and another competition object next week. In the meantime, back to our experts and the people of Farnham.
this is Spode. Uh, the pattern is 1946, so in fact that pattern was brought out in about 1815. That's when it was first done, and it must be before 1833 because Spode became Copeland and Garrett in 1833, so it's quite different. And a lovely punch bowl like that rings beautifully. I mean, that is really very desirable for a Spode collector. Probably worth something in the region of six to eight hundred pounds. Yes, I mean, it really, yes, really is good. Yeah, sure that, that's absolute. That. And of course, that's porcelain. It's a super yeah. piece. That. And how much uh, this one? Now, that one probably a little more you might well get uh, because of its shape it's a, it's a decorator's piece yes. rather than a collector's yeah, piece so 750 pounds even yes. even more than that it a a super that. yeah yeah <laughs> but it, it, with all its pieces yeah it's probably more than that but it really is lovely that very nice if you want to see whether the telescope's going to work yes. it's not broken the best way is to look from the wrong end oh i see and then then you can then see whether the, the, you see the cracks in the lenses oh i see Have which will any? cause distortion no it's all right yeah, it's all clean yeah. yeah that's a good example yes i think this is the finest bit of ruby bohemian ruby glass that i've ever seen the antiques road show it's it's enormous of course but the quality of this is absolutely fantastic Presumably you knew that it, where it came from, where it was made. Yes, I do indeed, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, I don't know the history. I know the history within our family, but yeah. I don't know the history further back. We can trace it back to 1860. Uh, right, we well, think. that's exactly... I think it was probably made perhaps even 1850. Usually yes. you, you give a date of 1860 yes. for Bohemian yes. glass, whether it's ruby flash like this or the overlay yes. type. But this is the most wonderful type here, I think, because the engraving is quite superb. Yep. There's a similar yes. one, I'm sure, in the v &A Museum of this, this sort of proportions yes. and this one. Yes. I'd better give you a value, I suppose. I'm not even sure I want you to, but do, right. nonetheless. Okay. <laughs> well, I think you should probably insure it for, say, £2,000, yes. and it would sell for, say, £1,500 to £2,000, yes. I think. That's it's lovely. a wonderful That's example. Lovely. We don't well, intend to so sell much. it. We'll always keep it. Good. <laughs> He's definitely English. It's, it, it says he's English, apart from many else. It says made in Great Britain. And um, I suppose he's, what, 1930. I love Snoopy anyway. Yeah, it is. Whoops. But he's such fun, and there are people that can collect um, Snoopies. So he's, he's got quite a lot of value. Um, and I say it's quite a lot of value. For an English toy, we're talking about ooh, 80 to 100 pounds, something like that. It's really a very, very charming thing, isn't it? It's, it is. it's um, this very beautiful girl walking yeah. through the woods with a basket of fowl on her head. And you even see a little title to the picture, isn't there, down here? Yes. yes. Oh, these brutes of fowl, as she's saying. Yes. The artist is Edward Henry Corbett. Corbett, yes. And this particular picture, as we can see down here, was painted in 1851. And he's put his nice little palette there with R.I. in it, which yes. means that he was a member of the Royal Institute of Painters. Yes. Um, and he was obviously proud of that as well he might be, so he put his palette down there. But tell me, I mean, do, do you know about Corbeau? Yes, I do. He was a, a friend of my husband's uncle. Oh, really? So, so there's a do direct know, connection Yes, it came there. from him and it's come from him, so... It was given by the artist yes, to yes. A, a, an uncle. Of, of yes. your husband, and it's been in your family ever since. Yeah. I mean, Corbett was an interesting artist because, uh, uh, one, he was a member of a family of artists, there were several other Corbetts yes, who were artists, was. and secondly, uh, he was uh, connected with Queen Victoria, wasn't he? Yes, he taught her. He taught he her. Was he was her, 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 her drawing master, master I think. That's right, and yes. all her children as well. Well, one can see from the quality of the drawing in this, that he was uh, obviously extremely good draftsman yes. in, the, in the drapery of the yes, way the dress falls. It's very, very lovely. Mm. That's jolly nice, but I, I'm also very intrigued by this picture. My, my mother-in-law bought it a long time ago for about five bob in a, in a auction. Did she? Did she? Yes. So it's possibly one of the most famous pictures, um, the image, that were painted in the 19th century. It's the horse fair, and the yeah. original is by Rosa Bonheur, the great um, French yes. animal painter, yeah. and one of the great female painters of the 19th century. And this picture, 
the original of which is absolutely enormous, is now in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. There's a, a picture that many, many artists painted almost partly as an act of homage and partly as a, trying to emulate uh, Rosa Bonheur. And this is actually rather a good one. I've seen many copies yes. of it, but um, the quality of some of the painting in here, particularly, for instance, this head here, yes, it's uh, is very beautifully done and makes one think possibly it is by an artist who was in his own right quite a good horse painter. Yes, I Who that is, I'm not sure. Have you got them in short at all? Um, not individually. Not individually. I think you should. I mean, the Corbould is a very lovely thing that probably should be insured for about five thousand pounds. And should this one, I should think, a similar sort of amount, five thousand pounds. Maybe should be now. With English East India Company, which was founded back in the uh, 17th century, um, shipped enormous quantities of porcelain from China to England. I mean, three million pieces of blue and white porcelain in one year in the mid-18th century. Incredible quantity. Where the hell it's all gone, I have no idea, but it's not around anymore. Um, and they were only dealing in blue and white porcelain. Yes. The coloured porcelain was organised as a private venture by a man who worked for the company called the Super or Supra Cargo. And he went to China he was the one who bought the right quantities, 5,000 cups, 5,000 sauces, 10,000 plates, and he organized all that. What he was also allowed to do was trade on his own behalf, as indeed were all the members of the crew. And what he used to do was, when he was back in England, he would organize for landed gentry in this country to have their coats of arms painted on Chinese porcelain and shipped back. And what you had to do was to get the College of Heralds to draw up your arms with, in the right colours. Yes. And this was then sent to China, and the Chinese copied it. Now, this was a problem because, of course, the Chinese didn't understand what they were doing. They didn't understand the human figure in the way we understand it. They didn't understand the writing. They got no clue what it all meant. And that led to the most marvellous mistakes. That lived a bit. <laughs> it, absolutely. Now, here we've got one, which is actually quite a good representation, I imagine, of, of the arms. I don't know it offhand. Uh, we've got the motto up here, this I'll defend. What had clearly happened was that the, the either the supercargo or, more likely, the lord himself had written the armorial bearing of the Lennox underneath just so that everybody knew what it was. Yeah, the general the title. The general title. The Chinese have said, ha, ah, this must go on, and they've copied it all out, which is marvellous. It's all completely wrong. It shouldn't be there at all. If it would have written the name of the match packet on the bottom. That's right. Oh, yes. <laughs> In fact, there's a very famous occasion where one, one member of the landed gentry was so mean that he didn't have the College of Heralds draw it up in colours as he should have done. He tore a book plate out of one of his books in the library, stuck it on a bit of card, and wrote red, green, gold, blue. <laughs> and the service came back and, yeah, <laughs> and it was red, green, because they copied it exactly. Yeah. And of course, they're much rarer. I think he must have broken the whole lot in disgust. They fetch a lot of money. This one dates from the probably about 1740, 1750. The quality of the painting of the flowers is actually exceptionally good. And this wavy border makes it that little bit better than the majority of them. Um, the value, I think, would probably today be somewhere in the region of uh, 700 to 1,000 pounds per plate. This was on a barge? Yes, well, in 1945, when the war ended, we were in Oxford and housing was short. And uh, well, a lot of people lived on the river at Oxford. You know the old barges, right. the Oxford yeah. barges. Yeah. Well, my mother rented one of these, and these were the only two things she'd salvaged from the war and right. her wrecked life. And these meant continuity, and she went everywhere with them. <laughs> so they Wonder. went onto the barge, and then the barge sank. So this had been underwater? Well, not quite, because we dashed on the gang tank. That's the only <laughs> two things she wanted to save, so we saved them. Oh, marvellous. <laughs> well, um, apart I've... from that, I mean, it's a, they are two exemplary pieces of furniture. But they're not the same, I guess, are no, they? No, they're not. And this is really why I'm so interested, because they show the revival. One the original, one the revival. This cabinet was made 
in the revival of the 18th century style for classicism and satin wood furniture and painted decoration, which what? would have been around about 1780, 1785, up as to the end of the century. Yes, but this is a revival piece. But the point about this is that it shows all the design features that one would expect to see on a piece of the 1890s. Yes. Rather than the 1790s of 100 years before. Yeah. But that period, the earlier one, was the first time that these exotic timbers were used with painted decoration. Yeah. What is the timber? I mean, I've This is satin. This is satin. satin wood. Wood. And I then see. you have some ebony stringing around the doors, sort of what, ebony this, border, this the black. Stuff, yeah. The black one here. This yeah. is rosewood. Yeah. Which and is then, rosewood? Which that's is the border. This one. Oh, yes. I see. That's yes. Rosewood. And then you've got gilt metal mounts enriching it. Uh, it's a very, very fine piece of its type. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing is that when this was bought, it was more valuable and thought more highly of than the earlier ones. Now, in the late 18th century, plain satin wood furniture was very popular. Yes. So you have a perfectly good 18th century Pembroke table of satin. Mm -hmm. Then great-grandfather buys a piece of new satin wood with painted decoration. Oh, what more natural than you take this along to a qualified artist and get oh, him to revive it and paint it to match the new. Oh, I see. And this was done in all fields of furniture. Really? So this is older? This so predates this, this by what? A hundred years. It is absolutely wonderful. You see here how yes. severe this looks. Yes. Right. Yes. Well, now, the addition of these flowers of festoons does nothing for it. No. If this had intended to be painted, it would have been of a lighter design, not so severe. The stringing would have been less architectural. Yes. And the handles would have been part of the design. Yes. Instead of as if plonked on in between. I see. So various things like that, plus the fact that the flowers are typical 19th century rather than 18th century. Yes. You know, one can get fairly technical about it. Yes. But basically the look, and if you look at these chaps' faces here. Yes, uh, yes the little cherries. Very that... 19th century faces. Are they? So those two pieces are as I say, exemplary of their type and a very good example of what we're talking about. Yes. Now, we have to think of values, I suppose. Uh, do you have them insured or do you have an no. idea of the value at all? No, I don't. I have them just under general house right. insurance. Well, what I think the, uh, the cabinet in its own right uh, would certainly, should be insured for somewhere in the region of five and a half, six thousand. And the table, Although repainted, because this type of furniture is fashionable, painted furniture is yes. very fashionable, would probably be eight to ten thousand pounds. I'm absolutely staggered. My goodness me, what an interesting um, album we have here. Life and Landscape on the Norfolk Broads by uh, Emerson and Goodall, the artist Goodall. Um, this is quite a rare item indeed. Um, so rare that um, it, it, you, you see sort of one a year, two a year come, come to the surface. Yes, indeed. There should be about 40 plates in here. Um, they're, they're a collaboration, of course. This, this whole thing is a collaboration between the two, um, Goodall being the artist and, um, and, and photographer, and Emerson being that great early experimenter. And um, his, his uh, work is, is much collected today. Yeah. Tell me some of the history of the, of, the, of the album. How did it come into your possession? Well, T.F. Goodall is my mother-in-law's grandfather, and the book right. was his. Um, he had a studio on a houseboat on the Norfolk Broads, and that's where he kept the book, which is why it's in pretty poor condition, I think. But yes, it is. it's just been in the family ever since. I have to say to you that editions similar to this, but in good condition, made at auction up to £15,000. One has to temper that valuation, however, with, with, by taking into account its condition. But it should be worth, it should be worth in the region of around seven or eight thousand pounds at auction today. Like that. Have you ever given, I mean, have you done any finding out? I have. Right, now tell me what you found out. I found out that it's very similar to the one by Monique. You're absolutely right, it is. But it's not signed, so I thought it's it was fake. Right. Um, well, it's not fair to call it a fake. This has been designed by a man called um, Maurice Sabino. And Sabino um, was a, a glassmaker in Paris. 
during the 1920s, during the 1930s. This particular figure is now becoming collectible because the, the Lali figures have just gone so through the roof, nobody can afford the damn things. So this figure today is probably worth in the region of a thousand pounds. Um, and I wouldn't be, su be surprised to see that double in value within the next five years. As far as we know, it's, uh, it goes back three generations. So from, it's your own, from your own family? From my wife's family, yes. From your wife's family. Yeah. That's splendid. It's a 17th century tooled leather case. And this wonderful portrait is on copper, as you know, I'm sure. And I did see, I'm just going to check the date again, that it is... 1642 actually said did, did you know it had a date on it <laughs> the date is just here it has no signature but during the middle to late part of the 17th century one of the main flemish painters of the time was gonzalez cox and i would say it's almost definitely certainly either by him or after him and that would place it really around that time and it is Flemish. But what is so wonderful about it? I mean, in, its, in itself, it is worth a lot of money, I would say, because it's so beautifully executed. But what is so fascinating is that in this box, but later, late 18th century, and beautifully painted, I take a few of them out, because you've got 50 in there altogether, on mica, and superbly painted, are these, one can only call it a portrait game. So if I put that on there, he is now a woman. <laughs> yes, it's quite um, amazing actually how the surround changes the whole, and, whole character of it. And that is so well painted in its own right, yeah. and that is definitely Flemish again, so it does all go together. And then we have a man the start. I mean, the colours are so good as well. It's obviously been kept extremely well in this silk-lined case. This could well be, as it's late 18th century, the Four Continents, America. What do you think? Could be, yes. Sort of a touch of the Red Indian. Yes. And it completely changes the face, doesn't it? Mm. It's absolutely wonderful. Oh, now we have, I think, Cupid and... No, it isn't. Oh, we have a... A lady of the 18th century. I've just gloss <laughs> over that quickly. <laughs> ah, we have another one. This is Cupid and Psyche. That's perfectly all right. That's ancient history, so I don't think that's, that's being too risky. Well, <laughs> the colours are superb. And, and I each have... Each one is sort of a sort of portrait in itself. Yes. Really. And quite honestly, I have not seen anything like this. And if this were to go into an auction, I would put a very wide estimate on it. It's got to be upwards of 5,000, possibly 10,000 pounds. <clears throat> Do you know anything about its history? Um, well, I know that it comes from a tomb in, in Rome. <clears throat> in Rome. Yes, in Rome. Rome. In Rome. Oh, that's good. Well, um, but I'm not absolutely 100% sure about it, but that is what I was told. OK, good. Well, that fits in well. I think uh, that this is 16th century Italian. Yeah. And it is, it is a plaque. It is actually, do you know that it's in gold? Oh, this is gold? It's actually gold. Yes. Oh, I thought it was silver. No, no, Big it's gold. gold. And we, you can, uh, by chance, I was looking at it, I thought it was gilt, in fact, gilt, silver, gold, metal. But just here in the corner, yeah. there's a small amount that's lifting. You yeah. see, and it's a very thin skin of gold, which oh, has been recrusted up uh -huh. and chased to give this decoration. It's a scene of Meliaga and Atalanta. You've got the hunters, Atalanta here in the middle with the bow, the boar. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a sort of retrospective scene at the back where the head is being presented. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. there, the head of the figure is lost. Mm -hmm. And the plaque is set onto a backing of some kind of plaster or something. Mm -hmm. But it's 16th century Italian, in my view. It's gold, and it is one of a group. Mm -hmm. And there are, I believe, six more of them in mm -hmm. the museum in Berlin. There are further examples in Vienna. They are supposed to be a series of plaques that were probably mounted on a, what must have been a spectacular cabinet. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Oh, not a tomb. No, a cabinet, I think. A, a cabinet. kind of cabinet, yes. Okay. And they're supposed to belong to the Borghese family. Yes. The Borghese family, of course, came from Rome. Yes, yes. Not only that, but the, the, they were originally attributed, these blacks, apparently, to Benvenuto Cellini. But they're now... Ah, uh, I thought, I thought it might be. Now, yeah. now, the latest thinking is that they're actually by Guillermo della Porta. Uh. And the scene itself is actually after Della Porta, who's a painter engraver. And he's known to have worked in gold, and he's known to have worked in Rome, mm -hmm. and the Borghese family worked right, in Rome. Yeah. And if you say it possibly came from Rome, then uh, perhaps I'm going to be right. Yeah, yeah. Now, it is quite extraordinarily rare. It's actually mounted up on a plaque of lapis. Yes, that my father-in-law had done. He had that actually fitted, yeah. right? Because, well, strange enough, I think that the others are also on lapis, but uh, if he obviously uh, was something of a scholar of the subject, he would have known that the other examples are on lapis. These are Cornelian panels. Yes. They have, they look reasonably good to me. Obviously, it's been framed. Yeah. Uh, this century and would originally, as I say, have been mounted possibly on the, the doors of this cabinet, which could have been broken up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But this must be confirmed by somebody who is a specialist in uh, 16th century Italian uh, mm -hmm. art. So if it is what I'm saying it is, 16th century Italian, I would think that it must be worth somewhere between uh, 30 and 50,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. 30 and 50. And yeah, 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 I understand. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't much matter whether one singles out the porcelain or the furniture or the pictures. It all adds up to a programme of marvellous quality. So our warm thanks to the people of Farnham. And uh, as for the final outcome on uh, Simon's gold plaque, well, we'll just have to wait for a week or two with bated breath for that. But uh, we'll let you know. Just before we go, a quick mention of the Antiques Roadshow collection, which is available from most good paper shops. And that's a record of many of the things, many of the wonderful things, that you'll see during this series of the programme. We're off now to Northern Ireland, and I very much hope that you'll join us there at the same time next week. Until then, from everyone here in Surrey, goodbye.